Well, good morning, uh, colleagues. It's an awesome pleasure for me uh, to introduce our second in conversation with the topic uh, today. And we are privileged to have with us Professor Michael Kahn. And I joked with him a little bit earlier to say, to say that he has the same initials as Michael Knight. And when you're gonna hear him in his driving seat today, you will, you will understand why I am bestowing on him this prestigious title of the, not the Knight Rider, but the Khan Rider. Well, Michael wow. is, uh, no, um, uh, is a well-known person in the country uh, and he has played a significant role in uh, participating in policy analysis and uh, has been um, closely affiliated in advising the Minister of Education, Science and Technology. He's currently a research fellow in the Center for Research on Evaluation Science and Technology at Stellenbosch University, and has held many prestigious positions, as you would have seen in the flyer. Uh, he's also an extraordinary professor at the University of the Western Cape and professor of practice of the University of Johannesburg. His training draws on engineering, physics, and education policy, and he plays, as I've mentioned earlier, a significant role in consulting uh, his expertise and contributing to some really, really important work uh, to government and other um, agencies. Michael, thank you so much for giving us the honor to host you today. And um, we are uh, thankful also that you uh, were very um, welcoming and offered to present to us the work that you have published and worked on for some time on the origins and the destination of uh, African doctoral graduates. As we know, um, we have a great number of African scholars taking up uh, postgraduate studies at our university somewhat uh, at the extent of up to about 40%. But what happens to them after they graduate? And this is going to be the core of uh, Michael's presentation to you. And uh, we look forward to your engagement. Uh, you can post your, your questions uh, in the chat box. Renata will help me to monitor that as we go along. And uh, without any further ado, Michael, over to you and welcome to all our participants who have given up their time to be part of this important uh, discussion. Over to you, Michael. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Himmler, uh, for your uh, very kind introduction. Uh, the honor is really mine and I'm delighted to share with uh, the members of the Academy, as well as others who've joined in the, the streaming. Since it's thank you time, I do want to acknowledge particularly uh, Dan Dutoy of the Department of Science and Innovation, who's backed this work since already in 2015, and also to acknowledge uh, the two research assistants who worked with me at UWC, Joshua, Ogonitega, who hails from Nigeria, and Tandi Gamedze, who is a South African. Uh, they've really carried, particularly Joshua, the very hard lifting, the very heavy lifting that I'll describe a little bit later in, in the presentation. Uh, I see I've got about 40 minutes, so I can go slightly slower than I'd intended to. Uh, the origins of this work really go back a long way because the question of immigration, emigration into the science research system and the skills sector in general has been a topic of great concern for policymakers and others for decades and decades. Uh, in the late uh, 90s, Dave Kaplan at UCT initiated a project to look into immigration losses. And he realized already then that the biggest problem one faced was data. And we then followed that up in 2002 when I joined the HSRC 
with a study that was published under the title Flight of the Flamingos. And it really carried on from where Dave Kaplan and his colleagues left off. Um, and it was particularly important in terms of timing because that was the last year in which the Department of Home Affairs captured any data at the moment of exit from the country. And that really is something to hold from the outset in what I described uh, to you in terms of this project, that it all comes down to data and access to data. So the, the study of the mobility of the highly skilled that I've given the acronym MOTHS has long standing and is extremely important to policy. In discussing the issue over many years with many people, when it became clear just how large the uh, international postgraduate complement in our universities had become, the question was being discussed. I would put the question to knowledgeable people. So where do, in particular, the doctorate students go to? And without fail, the answer was, well, if we don't want them to stay, they are going to go to Geneva or Seattle or even Beijing or Munich, but they will definitely leave Africa. And that was the uh, common uh, perception, the common view at the top level of government and also among vice chancellors and deputy vice chancellors. So in starting this work, my research question was to try to answer that. Where indeed do the students go to, the qualifying graduates, where do they go to? Null hypothesis, they leave Africa and let's test that and see how we're going to go about it. The context in which this is all uh, happening is uh, our own innovation system of which this audience is a part and the inescapable fact that we have had roughly two decades of stasis all efforts to talk up uh, expenditure on R&D to reach a target of 1.5% have failed. Uh, we have, in truth, never cleared the 1% mark, and no African country has cleared the 1% mark either. It all comes down, in effect, to the number of researchers in the system, because fundamentally, and I, I suspect this isn't widely appreciated, when you're computing the expenditure on R&D, your main cost is people. And the second main cost is the facilities in which the people sit so that this mysterious uh, entity, gross expenditure on R&D, GERD, as it's abbreviated, is driven entirely by the number of researchers you employ. If you employ more researchers, GERD will go up. If you employ the same number of researchers, but you pay them more, GERD will go up but it doesn't mean your capacity will go up. Linked to this are the other targets that were set in the 10-year plan of 2008, that we would annually produce 3,000 PhDs in STEM. And this now takes you to the fundamental questions. How do you get there? Do you expand higher education? Do you fund differently? Do you fund differentially? Do you change the landscape? Do you change, for example, the relationship between our public research organizations and the universities and industry to make it possible for students to be supervised in non-university settings. And then of course, the really tricky one politically, what about foreign recruitment? So those are all questions to be pondered uh, as one thinks through this, uh, this set of issues. We are not alone in receiving large numbers of students from Africa. Uh, France has, uh, in 2018, and roughly 4% of its students came from Francophone Africa, La Francophonie. We in South Africa, 36,000. And if you compare other countries receiving students from Africa, we are really number two uh, in, in, in Africa. Uh, Morocco receives an input, Saudi Arabia from the Maghreb states and so on. But this is a very important contribution to our university life. And as I'll argue later, it's a very important contribution to Africa. So that's what inward mobility looks like. 
The postgraduate output of the system as a whole, uh, these, uh, this data comes from the Council on Higher Education, thank you. And the most recent data is 2018. And the most important thing for you to look at is the second bottom row doctoral graduates. And in 2013, it was 2051. And in 2018, somewhat north of 3000. So the big target of attaining 3000 in STEM is clearly impossible. It cannot be met. It has not been met. The next table uh, draws on the work being uh, conducted routinely at the HSRC in the unit known as CESTI, the Center for Science, Technology and Innovation Indicators, who conduct the annual R&D survey. And this piece of work receives uh, good attention from the National Advisory Council on Innovation, and of course, from the parent department, DSI, but regrettably, uh, does not appear to be widely disseminated in university circles. And I would guess there are many DVCs in this audience who probably uh, are not that familiar with the detail that is provided in, in this work. Uh, this particular table uh, has not been populated beyond 2017, and that for the reason for that would have to be provided by uh, HSRC. But the important thing is that this is the only place where you can obtain a, a headcount of postdocs, as well as a breakdown of the students into what they call non-South African, I prefer international and South African. And so when Himmler says 40% are this and this, you can see those figures uh, accurately in, these, in this table. And in particular, you would see that among postdoctoral fellows, it swings beyond the 40%. In fact, it's close to 60% of postdocs in the, in the period 2015-16 were international. And this has a very important consequence for the system. And if I forget to tell you what that is at the end, please remind me. I just want to get to the core of the, the story. So the bigger context in which this is happening, of course, is our commitment to the Southern African Development Community, SADC. We signed up for the protocol in education and training two decades ago. And that protocol requires member states to provide places in their university systems at all levels, up to 5% of the total, and to charge those students, those international students from SADC, domestic fees. And we can have a discussion about that as well, the extent to which international students are charged any significant differential by virtue of being international as opposed to domestic. I've already mentioned we have a high percentage of international PhDs and postdocs. We don't know in the data who counts as an African. You will find tables of data produced by universities and so on, attesting to the number of African students, African, white, Indian, colored, as we still uh, routinely report. And is an African somebody who's African in, in South African terminology or African because they happen to be somewhat uh, lighter skinned but come from Mauritius and that's part of Africa? We don't know. And fundamentally this question, where are you now? So fortunately, the department decided to back the, the project and the NRF duly came to the party and provided a grant which ran over 2016-17 and there was no further grant money for the next two years of the project which uh, we managed to run basically on fumes, on petrol fumes. But we brought it to what I hope you will find is a satisfactory conclusion. How am I doing for time? I think I'm okay. All right. The big question now would be, where are you going to get data on the students? And we decided to concentrate on international African students because otherwise it would have been overwhelming in terms of volume that we'd have to look at. So we approached the universities through the front door, which means writing to the registrar with a request to get access to the student database. And that was greeted with no. 
and the reason being confidentiality and even in those days there was already reference being made to poppy which has now come into force but essentially it was get thee gone we are not going to help you someone at uwc then came up with the bright idea that we could perhaps work with the alumni offices and to our delight a number of our alumni officers said yes uh, we will be pleased to disseminate your instrument after it's obviously gone through ethical approval uh, we'll do it for you because no we will not allow you access to our database and i guess the reason for that is it's not just that it's proprietary uh, to the university but people are afraid that you might use it for promotional or commercial uh, reasons so we spent the, the worst part, I would say, of 2016-17, trying to make that approach work. It's interesting that at least one of the leading universities in the country refused to cooperate. And the stated reason was, this is the kind of social science research that we don't think is important. And I will leave the university uh, in question anonymous. But it really came as a, a severe shock. Anyway, we proceeded with this approach using the alumnus office and of course it was jeopardized from day one because we had no control over the number being sent we couldn't compute a return rate and there was no possibility of a follow-up for a non-return so we had to abandon it as a failure and there's nothing that can um, energize someone as much as having had a failure in a research project where you've committed to deliver something so that forced uh, it, the, it forced us to look for a new approach. One possibility would have been to go to graduation records because some of the universities uh, publish a program with a nice little biopic of the doctoral students. Uh, this is uh, a degree being awarded to uh, Mama Ketso uh, Okojungu from uh, Kenya, and she is from Makerere University and I studied previously biochemistry, etc. So you could immediately identify a, an international student by that path. The problem is there's no standard biopic. Most universities do not provide those little biopics and the records of these biopics are non-existent. The only way to actually get that graduation program would be to attend each graduation ceremony um, and that's impossible. So that was going to go nowhere. Hemus would appear to be the obvious place to go to, but for those of you who've worked with Hemus output data, it's anonymized and there are also data gaps. Another possibility was home affairs. And after a very promising discussion at the top level of the administration, I made the application and I was then told, no, poppy, 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 go away, we can't help you. So we were really stuck as to how to proceed. And at that point, a, a light bulb goes off. And we knew, of course, that the universities, as a legal requirement, demand that every graduate uh, deposits a PDF version of their dissertation with the library. And to its credit, the uh, NRF has got a national portal that captures all of this information, uh, all of these PDFs to a central site. And you can, with great patience, go into that site and have a look. The problem with the, um, the ETD portal, it's not really a database, it's a collection. Uh, the search facility is extremely limited and the designated fields are inadequate. So in principle, you've got what you want, but this is not Germany. In Germany, there's a database that gives you full detail. And I should add that previous discussions with various parties, including CHE, going back as far as 2006 to develop a PhD database, have not borne fruit or didn't bear fruit at the time. So what we got was the idea, perhaps we can go through these, uh, the, the ECD portal and pick out international African students by inspection. And here, of course, I have to offer a little 
uh, personal biography, which is that I spent 13 years working in Botswana between 77 and 1990, when it was possible to come home. And in the course of that, I taught students from many countries and I worked with staff from many African countries and I picked up the ability to spot, according to a surname, where your most likely country of origin would be. And so what I did was I took two universities for one year each and I went through roughly a thousand records for each of the two and picked out what I believed would be uh, international African students. Of course, when you get to a name like Dlamini, you're in serious trouble because there are Dlaminis here in Eswatini, uh, southern Mozambique, and certainly in Zimbabwe. So it is an outlier. But if you see a student whose name begins OL or OM, or, or a name with a lot of J's or lots of MB's and Y's, you can fail with a high degree of confidence, say, say, well, I think I'm looking at my, my students from Nigeria or Kenya or Rwanda. So I did that, an optical scan and produced lists for those two cases. And then I went to Joshua, my student, and I said, Josh, will you do the same blind? and let's compare. And so that's what we did. Josh is Nigerian. We compared and we got a 90% overlap and we could also obtain from this numbers. Uh, the number of international students for that university for that year within up to 90% level is for argument's sake, 82. And at that point, uh, Hemus came with a product that was very useful and that was an anonymized list of all the postgraduate awards, masters and doctoral for all universities and University of Technology for X number of years with nationality and resident status. Now, that sounds like gold and it is gold because it, would, it served to get us a confirmation that we were within the right ballpark of our accounts. Unfortunately, that database beside being anonymized, is also incomplete because some of the uh, residents and nationality information is completely absent. And that absence occurs for research universities as well as other universities. So it's not a characteristic you might think of uh, administrative efficiency. It might be reluctance or simply the information is unavailable. So there was our repository search taking shape. And what we did was we took the five years, 2012 to 2016, for UCT, Stellenbosch, KwaZulu Natal, Bits and Pretoria. And we, we know that they account for 60% of the contact doctoral graduates. So it's a good cut. We left out UNISA deliberately. And what we had to do was to go through 25,000 unstructured records without any contact data, nationality or bio data. And that's why I acknowledge Joshua again and again and again for his guts. We, in parallel, as already mentioned, had the HEMIS that provided us with headcounts, year, university, nationality, and so on. And that served as our cross-check. So that was the methodological approach. And that gave us a 1500 sample frame where we had performed the manual surname match. We had triangulated to an accuracy of 90%. We triangulated against Hemus to 90%. And now the question was, having got your list of names, how do you find them? And the answer is you use search engines. You go to Facebook and LinkedIn and you go anywhere else. And you start searching, for example, on the title of the doctoral thesis. And lo and behold, we were able to pick up 900 of those 1500 and use that as our target group. And we sent each of these uh, uh, graduates a personalized email with the necessary uh, opt-out clauses for ethical clearance and informed consent. Dear Dr. So-and-so, will you kindly complete this short online survey? And we achieved a sample return rate of 40%. We were further able 
to add to the fields where there were empty fields location, because some of you may know that IP Locator, which is a free uh, app, allows you to determine where a, an IP is, an active IP is in, in anywhere in the world. We ended up with a 95% confidence and a 5% interval. So that our results, we would say, are robust enough to start thinking about policy implications. So what did we find? We found 27% remained in South Africa. I'll explain a little bit more about that. A total of 64% went home. So there's the null hypothesis kicked out to touch. The majority of students return home. They do not leave Africa. 27% remain in South Africa, 64% leave Africa, another uh, uh, remain in Africa, sorry, another 4% go to positions other than with their previous employer and 5% were unknown. So go back to the top to the 27.5%, who are they? It breaks down into three groups, uh, roughly a third, a third, a third. The first third are uh, doctoral completers who were already in employment in a South African university. So they decided to improve their qualification. They were here, they remain here. The next third are those who've gone on to a wholly new job. They've got a, an appointment at one of the universities or they've got an appointment in the science council or in the business sector. So that's 8%. Uh, 9%, 9%, 9%. And the third group are those who remain behind for postdocs. And they will be here temporarily. The evidence from the data we got was that there were some who after six months of postdoc study have opted to continue their postdoc work in the US or somewhere else. And their fate is unknown, but their immediate destination was to remain here. So you can start to get a sense that the policy position of home affairs that on completion a doctoral or a, or a master's graduate is expected to leave is working. If that is your intention, it is working. If you say go home and as one of the previous cabinet ministers said, we do not want to draw in a single engineer from the rest of Africa, a drain, drain from Africa, what is happening is we are contributing to what might be termed brain circulation. We have uh, students coming to our universities, obtaining an excellent qualification and going home. Table three is just uh, another uh, little surprise there. Who's coming here? And we were surprised to find that the greatest concentration is actually uh, in the humanities and arts and the split, one might have assumed natural science would be much stronger, but it is only second up. All right, next one. This one is a bit too detailed, so I want to skip it. And I'd rather go to this, this one, which summarizes the story. And this was to compile um, the match between where you get your money from and your employer. Where are you now? And the thickness of the lines is proportional to the flow. So where you are funded by your previous employer, you go home. That's a very strong driver. It's perhaps unknown that a considerable proportion of the international African students are NRF funded. Hence, there's quite a thick line from South Africa to home. There's also own funds where the, the student has declared, I used my own money. And then the other uh, heavy line is where they've been funded by an international donor. So that summarizes it very beautifully. Home is where the heart is. Now, who are these people who are going home? A previous uh, publication, we looked at that aspect. And what we found is that the median age of the international African students on graduation is around 41 years. They are mature students. We also find that a very large proportion 
are actually on study leave and they also have family. So you will see in the acknowledgement in the, in the thesis, uh, to my dear husband for looking after the children or to my dear wife for looking after the children. Uh, there's uh, reference made to the place of employment, the uh, Institute for Tropical Disease or Makerere or uh, University of Zambia. So you can get the confirmatory evidence in terms of, in, the, in a narrative form. So mid-career, often married, often with a family at home, supported by their employer. Therefore, they are quite likely to go home as their first uh, port of call upon graduation. Confirmation of the brain circulation. Reasons for study in South Africa. Uh, reasons given the high quality of our programs, we should be happy to see that. South African funding, 29%. The availability of specialization, which I would link very strongly with the first one, high quality. Scholarship from home source was much lower, no response, 1.5. So what we've got here, we've arguably proven the method. It works. And it can be extended to any other group as long as you get ethical clearance for what you want to do. So we could uh, argue, we could do the next thing, which is to look at the next eight or 10 universities. We could look at UNISA as a special case for doctoral students. We could then be mad enough to do masters, but there we'd have to be very selective because the numbers are so large, you cannot possibly do this labor intensive searching. Of course, if home affairs came to the party, that would help considerably, because if we could get access to the study permits, we would be able to populate the nationality field from the outset, and that would make uh, identification and contact that much easier. So it's really a case where uh, if the political will could be found, we could really crack this uh, issue uh, much more uh, easily. So what have I got there? I can't read that, it's blocked. Um, brain circulation, yes I can. Cost to the taxpayer, let's bear in mind that the majority of these students are a part of the subsidy system. And of course there's the subsidy payment back to the universities, but there is also the front door subsidy in terms of them being charged uh, domestic fees. Their contribution of course is very important because the number of full-time equivalent research and instruction staff has remained fairly stable over the last 20 years. It hasn't grown by leaps and bounds. And the gap is being filled by the docs and postdocs. And that's important. This makes us very similar to the US where their reporting uh, shows the huge dependence on research assistance. And we're doing the same thing. I've mentioned going to the next universities and other groups. That's up to a potential funder. In terms of policy, the issue of uh, retaining students, retaining the postgrads, retaining the docs was already articulated in the Ministerial Review of 2012. Uh, in 2012, the National Development Plan, the National uh, Vision said the same thing, but went a lot further. Uh, arguing we should be giving seven-year work permits to international uh, doctoral graduates. And that has fallen on deaf ears in other departments. The immigration white paper said nothing about it. The white paper on SDI makes a little nod, but isn't really uh, providing a lead. So this is in a, a place, a policy vacuum. There are clearly uh, uh, political heads who don't want immigration, inward immigration of skills to occur at all, because the jobs should really be going to ourselves. And it takes, it leaves us in an impasse. When you add to that the changed NRA funding policy, which is to significantly to reduce the quantum of funds going to international students. Um, and then you finally add to that COVID-19, which regrettably is going to be part of our lives for many years to come, I believe we are facing a very severe crisis in our universities. And when we get back to something that looks semi-normal, where students are in lecture rooms, 
it will become apparent just what a large gap has been created in terms of the loss of foreign students, foreign postdocs, foreign docs, and the general uh, barriers to immigration. So with that, I say to you to Metsi in Setswara, thank you, Kiyabonga, Danki, and Asante in uh, Swahili, and thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Michael. That was really, really impressive. You see why I say you're like Knight Rider? I mean, you defied all the odds of obtaining the data to make sure that you persevered and uh, found the means, uh, even though you had the, the obvious uh, doors that you would have uh, gained access to closed on your face, but you managed to work around these by just uh, using what you knew could be resourceful avenues uh, to be able to access information. I'm just wondering how that approach, uh, since you did mention it with respect to uh, protection of uh, personal identification and the POPIA Act that will come into play on the 1st of July, um, to what extent this approach would be uh, considered uh, uh, inappropriate. I know that you have gone through all the necessary ethical protocols to be able to get to the data, and I was just thinking, as you said, that you used uh, surnames, uh, et cetera, uh, to try to, to refine the geographic region of origin. If I, as a human geneticist, did something like that, I would be crucified and lynched for doing some sort of anthropometric or uh, uh, a predetermined um, uh, identity in uh, grouping my groups as I would do it. But anyway, it's not about me and my field, it's about uh, education and what you've managed to glean. Very, very interesting to see. I, I absolutely love the map uh, that you summarized all the data in terms of uh, the relationship between the funders um, and you know, the, the kind of status quo of uh, individuals who come to our country for postgraduate studies and, and what um, kind of contributes also for their reasons, as you mentioned, to the extent of uh, over 60% who go back to their home countries. Very, very fascinating indeed. Um, colleagues on the line, I am um, hoping that uh, you may have some questions. Uh, I see um, Ellie uh, Grossman uh, put a, a, a bit on the chat box uh, with respect to dental research. Um, are we able to uh, give people opportunities, Renata, to, to ask a question verbally in the system? Let me just quickly get to the list of participants and I'll see if I can unmute um, Ellie, quickly, if you can just give me a second. Yeah. Um, and then there's also one from Marty from Nika. I think that's on behalf of Prof. Um, Johan Mouton. I think he's asking the. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. Oh, Michael, this has been published, correct? The yes, study? Yes. Yeah. There been two publications. Uh, there was the early one and then the one in um, uh, higher education. Right. Okay, uh, unmuted, sorry. All right. Can I, uh, can I ask my question? Yes, go ahead, Ellie, welcome. Over to you. Thank you. Michael, thanks very much for a most intriguing analysis of what happens to our uh, international doctoral students. I did a similar study, well not a similar study, on our graduates at dental research. And I found that at the time that everybody immigrated, there were plenty of opportunities for migration of skills. Uh, are these opportunities still available or um, 
is the fact that the system is almost closed so that they have to go home. What is your thought on that? Can you hear me? I'm in a very remote area, so my connection is very poor. No, you're coming through clearly. Shall I reply to each question as it comes? Have well, thank you. That. That's... Uh, it's, it's a great question and I can't answer you directly because to, to do that, to provide a direct answer, we would have to uh, interact directly with the, the participants in our survey and take the, the discussion to the next level. So if one were to, look, to try to get some hint of what's going on, we might want to uh, segment the data that we've got uh, by age and look at the youngest qualifiers and where do they tend to go? Because the median age people, they've got a job, they've got a family, they're going to go home. But if you come here at the age of 26 or something, um, you are perhaps more footloose. And so that might bring you closer to being similar to the group that uh, you were looking at, Ellie. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Johan Mouton's group at CRES says that uh, on the issue of methodology, uh, they have been doing this for the past five years or more. On the basis of this work, they were in fact awarded a new contract last year by the DSI to conduct a comprehensive doctoral tracer study across all universities between 2000 and 2018. Uh, the study is almost reaching uh, completion of more than 16,000 graduates and received more than 6,400 completed response from doctoral graduates over this period. You aware of that uh, study, Michael? I am aware of it. Um, what I didn't include in, in this presentation is the um, new attempts that were made to try to answer the, the problem of uh, lack of data uh, that emerged about 10 years ago. And that was pioneered by Henk Mutt working out of Leiden. Um, and what they have done is to say, well, two, they've done two things. The first is to say that if you study the bibliographic database, a Scopus or Web of Science, and you concentrate by design on scientists who are publishing, and you have a look at their affiliation, that allows you to track where they are. So you can do mobility studies for a select group, namely scientists who publish. And the, the, um, the, Els the uh, Leiden group went so far as to work with the World Bank doing a study on science in Africa where they used only bibliographic and bibliometric data to quantify uh, scientific output, arguing that the ability of African countries or the interest of African states to capture expenditure on R&D uh, was non-existent. So I think the same thing is, is the same approach is being used by the, the Stellenbosch uh, Crest people. It's different. It's not, ex it's not the same method. Um, it is obviously uh, feasible with the energy uh, at one's disposal to generate a very large database based upon your publication record. And this is different. All this right. Is, uh, if, 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 yeah, if Johan or whoever posted that wants to respond, um, you're welcome to in a minute. But in the meantime, I'd like to ask uh, Mary Scholes to post her question. Over to you, Mary. Thank you very much, Himla. And, uh, Thank you, Michael. I, I really enjoyed that uh, presentation. Um, I've looked at some of the numbers in the past, and I wonder if you could uh, confirm whether the data still support the idea that the international students outside of South Africa have a higher throughput rate than the South African students. And it may be driven by the fact that, you know, they, they need to go home for the various uh, purposes that you listed. So on a very cynical note, then, if they are receiving funding from donors and or the South African government funding in some way, 
are they not a much better return on investment? Because even if they do not remain in South Africa for scholarly purposes, in the big picture of things, they still are publishing initially with a, a South African linked address. And then they are going back to their countries to train further students, which we may possibly get in the longer term. Could you please make a comment? Thanks. Uh, Mary, thank you. Um, absolutely spot on questions. Uh, I think there are about three uh, that I counted. The uh, period to graduation of the sample we looked at is slightly shorter than the South African. I think we were at about 4.3 years compared with 4.6. So there's not a lot in it. Um, my spec personal speculation would be that it is in the interests of a university hosting an international student to make sure they graduate as quickly as possible because A, it suits the student and B, it suits the university, which can then go, go to go and collect its subsidy payment more quickly. So there is a co-incentive at work here that the university is incentivized to get the students through. The uh, student is incentivized, I want to go home as quickly as possible. So how that is playing out would have to be a separate study beyond where we've gotten to now. And as I've already said, we're stranded. We've got no further funding to take this uh, anywhere into the future. What we'd also intended to do at the beginning was to look at co-publication. So to what extent is the fact that you have uh, worked with Professor X at WITS and you have published together with Professor X, when you go home, do you continue to publish with Professor X or does it dissipate? All of these uh, topics, all of these matters are, are food for further research and are, are really important uh, to, to understand and unpack. So you're spot on, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Johan Muton, welcome. Um, I see your hand up, over to you, Johan. Sorry, Imla. Um, yeah, apologies, it looks like uh, Michael van Nikkerk has taken over my identity, <laughs> so, or, yes. vice, or vice versa. Yeah, thanks for, uh, to Michael for an interesting presentation. Of course, we talk often enough that I was aware of the gist of this, but I just need to correct the point about methodology. The, the, the point that I made in the chat was that we have in fact followed uh, exactly the same methodology. Uh, what's happened at Crest uh, over a number of years is that we saw the value of investing in a database of South African theses doctoral dissertations, uh, which we started some years ago. And then uh, when the Water Research Commission and the Commission of DSI put out a call for a study, exactly, it's called a, a doctoral place study, uh, approximately 18 months ago, we uh, won that tender and we started the work. Now, Michael is correct, uh, a huge amount of the grant went to us putting together a team of six assistants uh, you need that intense effort uh, for our team to do this. So exactly what we did was first we knew, we knew from HEMA's data that between 2000 and 2018, there were about 32,000 doctoral graduates in the system. That data is fairly reliable at the aggregate level. Secondly, we then crawled all the institutional repositories of all 24 universities and managed to download 29,000 theses so that's about 94, 90, uh, 94%. And then um, exactly the same methodology was followed. This was last year between January and June. It took the team six months to literally search for these 29,000 uh, people because of course you have the name of the student on the thesis uh, and the university to find uh, some contact details. And of those 29,000 records, we could eventually identify 16,000 emails, also some LinkedIn profiles and research conflicts. And then in August last year, we sent out 16,000 emails. And by December, we had received uh, 6,500 completed questionnaires, which is a 46% response rate. So this is, um, it follows on the work of Michael. It, it was done with this additional funding. 
And as we speak, we're finalizing the report, uh, which has to be submitted in two weeks to the Water Research Commission. And uh, we're addressing very similar questions to what Michael is doing, uh, because um, we have a much larger sample and also we have a much longer questionnaire, we hopefully will be able to address some more fine-grained questions which are coming up. So um, initial, initial indications are that about 40% goes back to their home country and 10% uh, to a country elsewhere in the world and about 35% stay in the country. So it's, it's not outside of the ballpark that Michael is. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Himna. Thanks, uh, Johan, for complimenting that. Uh, Professor Marisa Rolnick, uh, you've been putting some comments on the chat. Would you like to ask Michael your question directly? Uh, well, they were similar. I don't know which are the best ones. Whichever one you think is most important. <laughs> um, I think the first one was the one that occurred to me. And hello, Mike, how are you doing? Nice to see you. Um, is uh, the question that Mary partially raised, which was the issue of non-completing students and how many of these there are. But I think we got the answer on that. So... Um, I would be interested to know his thoughts on the implications of the NRF's new policy on age limits. Uh, I'm sure that age limit also applies to international students as well, for bursaries, I mean. Okay, um, Michael? Yeah, thanks, and, and hi, Marissa. We, we don't chat often enough. Uh, good to see you. Nice picture. Um, the age limit, actually, I, you would have to teach me about that. I missed that one. The um, completion rate, I partly addressed that uh, in my response to, to Mary. The, the big question for me, which uh, I haven't been able to, to go into, is whether the universities are in any active way trying to run a sausage factory because the incentive would be there. And to try to answer that is really very, very tricky indeed. Nobody's going to admit to it. So when you've got what's in effect a cash cow staring you in the face, how do you resist? Now, one clue to that would be in the topic of study. And without providing some statistical confirmation of what I'm uh, going to say next, the strong appearance is that the topic of study corresponds very strongly to the discipline area in which the candidate was previously working. So for argument's sake, if you come from the International uh, Livestock Research Institute, and then you go to one of our universities and study a uh, particular form of animal-borne disease, and you do your field work back in your country of origin, that makes perfect sense in terms of uh, career development. So that would rule out the, the sausage factory uh, possibilities. The actual dropout rate, um, well, that's actually impossible to, to answer from this study of ours because we are working from a published thesis. So you haven't dropped out, you've succeeded. Um, Johan's work might uh, be able to answer that, but this, the study that we conducted cannot by design. Um, the age, age limit, um, won't you just give me the numbers and then I can comment further? Well, uh, I think Johan has put them in the chat. Um, yeah, Johan has responded to that in the chat, so uh, let, let's let people do that so I could get a few other uh, comments in. Uh, Morning, Val. Val Mizrahi. Uh, Val posted something in the chat. Would you like to ask Michael your question? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Hibna. Uh, Michael, a very, very interesting, um, interesting presentation. Thanks for this. I, I was really struck by your last comment, uh, which is the looming uh, research and teaching capacity crisis that we're going to face. Um, I think each of us in our own environments is fully aware of what international students, uh, postdocs, are doing to support 
for instance, supervision at honors level and to do undergraduate teaching. Um, is the higher education sector aware of this looming crisis? Uh, and if so, what are the uh, what what steps are being taken? Uh, I realize you might not be able to answer this, but I think that it is something that we should concern ourselves with, as as a community of scholars. Uh, what how, how are we going to meet this particular gap? Which I think, and I think we're all experiencing it. Of course, exacerbated by the pandemic-related travel restrictions. How are we going to meet this gap? Thanks, Mike. Well, uh, thank you and good to see you, uh, Valerie. Thanks for the question. Um, for its part, the Department of Science and Innovation is, is as aware as anyone else who's in this meeting because uh, I did a, a presentation to their EXCO in March. So whether they are having this discussion with colleagues across the, uh, the street in DHET uh, I, I'm not competent to answer that. I don't know. Um, but it is, it has to be a major concern to, to, the, to the minister. And whether the minister's been briefed, I also do not know. Perhaps that's something the academy can take up. Thanks, sir. Uh, Pius, I see your hand up. Uh, do you want to ask your question? Oh, I, I did not realize you are referring to me. It's Petty Wematutu here. Oh, sorry. I'm just reading what's <laughs> at the bottom. I can see um, I've got a new name. Uh, Pius has Yeah, taken. everybody's having changed identities today. Uh, sorry, Petty Go ahead. Uh, sorry, it's a bit noisy this side. Uh, thank you very much, Michael, for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, the key question which keeps on being asked by parliamentarians each time we talk about um, funding for postgraduate students is whether our students uh, stay in the South African system or they go away. And the belief is that we are having, we are losing uh, the students that we fund uh, within the system. Has there been a study along those lines? And um, the, the other uh, issue, which I consider to be quite significant is that we tend to keep um, young people on contracts. It's very difficult for them to get permanent employment. And it's going to be very difficult to entice South Africans uh, to work under those conditions, whereas for international students, that's easy. So it, the, the, the wrong of not creating uh, permanent positions uh, cannot be corrected by uh, just importing students uh, who are not South Africans. We need to correct that and create a certain level of um, uh, um, certainty and permanency in terms of positions. Just look at uh, the academics that we are employing. Look at how many are temporary versus those who are full-time. About 40% are, 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 are permanent. So that cannot be corrected uh, by just importing more people that we are going to be exploiting. Uh. Thank you. A good point. Uh, I would suggest that we go and toy toy at Treasury um, because by my own reading, Treasury has been very hard on the public research, on the public uh, research institutions from 1994. Whether it's the universities or the science councils, they have been squeezed very tightly. And when you add to the squeeze in terms of posts, the fact that the public sector has managed to attain 3% real salary growth over 20 years, then you begin to see the answer to your own uh, stated problem, that those who are in permanent and pensionable positions um, are enjoying a bonanza, and therefore you try to keep going by employing people on contract whether they are international or local. So it is a very fundamental choice that has been made over the last 25 years. And it is only something that can probably be resolved uh, at ministerial level where a campaigning minister 
who really sees the problem in the way that I believe many in this room do, uh, is able to make the case. And it's not going to be easy given the hardships that we are currently facing. So sorry, it's a bit of a downer to bring this, this uh, session to, to its end, but it is tough. Toy toy to treasury would be my slogan for the day. <laughs> oh my God. Johan, I, I, I will give you a few minutes to comment on the challenges around the postdoc. Uh, so please go ahead. Yeah, it, it actually links up quite nicely with the last point that Michael did. Yes. Um, yes. So very quickly, um, we have found in the study, as I said, which is about hopefully to, to be released, that 20% of uh, the people who graduated, and we're talking about about 1,200 people in our sample, actually uh, uh, went into a postdoctoral fellowship immediately after completing the, the doctoral graduates. And of course, about 40% of them are from the rest of Africa. So the, but the more interesting thing is, which links to the question about a non-expanding system, is that we also find in our sample people who have had repeat postdocs so you have people who take on a two-year postdoc, followed by another two years, another two years. So there's a sizable proportion, and it becomes a form of employment simply because there are no opportunities for them to be permanently employed. Uh, appointed. So elsewhere in the world, this has been identified as a real problem for the system. And given the stasis of the system that, uh, that Michael has indicated, that the fact that, that we have these postdocs in the, in the system and by the way, we've disaggregated it by field. It is more prominent in the natural sciences and the health sciences that we get these postdocs than in the social science humanities. So exactly in the STEM fields where we need to expand, there are no jobs for these postdocs, so they have no choice. And they become what we call serial postdoctoral fellows. And that is a major policy problem for the government. And it's also a problem for the NRF because they are not, uh, the, in terms of, the age thing, by the way, the problem is that there's no, not enough funding for doctoral graduates uh, from other African countries. But that's, uh, there's, a, there's a whole separate narrative around that, which I will not enter into. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Colleagues, we could go on. Michael, you have obviously stimulated uh, many of the think tankers uh, uh, within this uh, participation. And uh, there are many, many comments uh, and, and, and some additional ones that I haven't had the opportunity to get to. Uh, we will save all of this. And I think it was Anissa Khan uh, who asked a few questions, but we'll try to respond to that uh, uh, through you, Michael, if you don't mind, uh, by email or something. Sure. Uh, colleagues, thank you so, so much for participating in this rather engaging and participatory um, in conversation with series. Uh, this is a, a new uh, format uh, of webinars that uh, I have introduced at ASAF uh, because sometimes we have some really uh, critical topics that we want to give uh, uh, an, an expert an opportunity uh, to speak to us on. Normally the time that we have on webinars, people just get between 10 and 15 minutes to, to air their points of view. And it uh, was my idea that we introduce uh, such a, a, a system into our webinar series so that we could have this kind of intensive discussion on topical issues. So thank you, Michael, so very, very much for pursuing with us the opportunity to give this talk to the members and other stakeholders. And as we can see from uh, various uh, contributions, um, there are many, many interesting ideas around all of this, and it is a critical concern uh, within academia. Um, I would uh, like to thank you and all participants for uh, once again giving us your time and want to announce that our next series is going to be hosted on the 6th of July, and now we're heading to the skies. So from Michael Khan Knight, or Niati, as the um, Nando's ad uses, we are going to stray our eyes to astronomy. And uh, we have uh, Kevin Governor and Vanessa McBride, who are going to speak to us on the 6th of July. 
So uh, keep that in your radar, but you will definitely get uh, um, a flyer announcing that. Colleagues, uh, wonderful to see so many old friends and so many you of you online. Have a good day going forward. And uh, uh, this has been really an excellent discussion. And Michael, again, a heartiest thank you to you for all of this. Well, thank you. Ciao, so ciao. Thank you. Thank you, Academy. And have a good day. Thank you. Ciao. <laughs>